Hey family, Pastor Ben Warwick here, and I'm super excited to have you joining with us today. I know the Lord's put a word on my heart, and I hope that it ministers to you right where you are. In fact, I want you to take a moment and take this link, share it with your friends, let them know this word is coming, and I want you to hang in there until the very end, because I'm gonna come back and pray over your needs. So let's jump into this word and be blessed. morning. Thank you, guys. Well, before we start, I feel like I told first service, I have to clear my name. Ben does pack the lunches every morning, but I have never forgotten to put them in their backpack, okay? Now, they are telling on me, though, because the days that we don't have school, I try to pack our lunch when we go to the park, you know, not eat out too much for the budget, but sometimes I'll say, oh, no, we left our lunch. Looks like we got to go through the Chick-fil-A lunch. <laughs> Get Chick-fil-A. So I promise they eat every lunch every day. But no, it is such an honor to be here. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the room. I have to give a special shout out to my mom who's on the front row. She started her morning off with my kids. Um, we dropped them off last night so that I could study and prepare and get a full night's sleep and her, her and my dad watched them all night, but I just am so honored to have you here and I would not be the woman I am without you today. And I wanna to honor too my amazing mother-in-law who's celebrating with Jesus today. She was always just such a big encourager and a cheerleader for me. And, I'm just excited. Uh, so me and Ben have been married, it'll be 12 years next month, 12 years. We were babies. I was 20. I had just finished my sophomore year of college. We got married in the summer. We moved. I moved eight hours away to join him because he had already gotten a job as a youth pastor out in North Carolina. And I'll never forget the first couple months we were there, um, I was getting to know the youth group. Most of them were only like two years younger than me. I had no idea what I was doing. And he said, hey, I have a conference. I need you to preach for me. And I was like, I don't do public speaking. I was like, give me a small group. Give me a devotion to lead. But I'm like, ugh. But I was like, okay, you know, we're newlyweds. I wanted to be like, yeah, I got this. So I preached and it went fine. But uh, Pastor Avery can attest to this. The youth are a hard audience. They just stared at you the whole time. So Ben asked me how it went. I said, I think it was good. Everyone just looked at me. And that day I told him, I am never doing that again, never preaching again. And I haven't until today. This is my first time in 12 years doing public speaking. But a few months ago when we were talking about Mother's Day, I actually came to him and said, hey, I know this is crazy, but I think it's the Lord because again, I don't wanna do speaking, but I just really feel like God's given me a word for Mother's Day. And he's given me such a heart for mothers, and I'm so excited to share that. So if you wouldn't mind standing for the reading of the word, we are going to be doing a lot of reading. Just like Ben, I have quite a few scriptures, so you'll get your weekly reading in today. Uh, if you'll turn with me to Joshua chapter 2, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 14. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. <clears throat> she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So then the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the fords of Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Zion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family, because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the man assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully. Then the Lord gives us the land. So a little context. 
Um, a few verses down, they tell Rahab, okay, make sure to hang out a scarlet cord out of your window because her house was on the walls of Jericho and we will know to spare your household. So we're gonna skip now over to Joshua chapter six, verses 20 through 25. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it, But they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. I want to speak on this thought today, the story of us finding our purpose in God's plan. How about this? If you pray for me, I'll pray for you. Dear God, I just thank you this day that you've given us, God, this time that we get to come into your holy presence, God, this time that we get to celebrate all the moms and the special women in our lives, God. God, I pray that you would just be with each and every person in here, God, anyone who's walked in broken, God, who is struggling with their purpose and their passion, who may just feel like they are lost and drowning, God. God, I pray that you would just begin to move, remove those burdens and those shackles, God. I just come against any distraction today, God. I pray that you would just open our eyes and ears for what you have to say, God, that every word that comes out of my mouth would be yours, Lord. I just thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we are a note-taking church, so if you want to take notes, feel free. There is a note card um, in the back pocket in front of you, and feel free to take pictures. Um, But you know, I wrestled a lot with what I wanted to preach on today. Like I said, I've kind of been preparing for months because I was like, I need a lot of time. And um, when I think of Mother's Day, I think of brunch. I think of flowers. I think of the long nap that I'm going to get later today. You know, I think of all the fun things. And so I was like, you know, maybe I should speak on something like joy or peace or the fruits of the Spirit. So talking about a prostitute was not at the top of my list. Uh, But for some reason, the Lord just really drew me to this passage. You know, I kept coming back to the broken world we live in and the burdens that mothers and people are carrying and just the darkness that is attacking our families and our kids' identities. And God just kept speaking to me, that's the point. That's the point. People are searching everywhere for a purpose. They're looking everywhere, everywhere for a purpose. And God's saying, but I am that purpose. I have those answers. (laughs) Thank you, Pastor Donnie. (laughs) I told Ben, I said, I hope Pastor Donnie's in the second service. (laughs) I believe there are mothers and people in this room who are weary, who wonder what's next, who feel like they are just drowning in one storm after the next, who can't seem to get their head above water long enough to take a breath. I hear it so often during times that we're experiencing of economic stress and, you know, I think of just everywhere you look on social media and the news, just the darkness and the sadness and just the loss of hope that we're experiencing in our world. So many people are just surviving. They're just saying, I got to just get next day to the next day to the next day. And they're not thriving the way that God intended us to. But I'm here to tell you this. You have a purpose. And today there are three things that I want to talk about when it comes to our purpose and what God has in store for us in our purpose. The first one is this. You have a purpose no matter your past or your present. How many people have ever set out on a direction in life or have made a decision that you thought would take you one place, but you ended up in a totally different direction that you didn't like? Maybe, maybe it was something out of your control. Maybe it was a trauma or a loss that led you down a direction where you've lost your faith. Or maybe it wasn't anything bad, no sins, or it was just I got busy with life and I'm just living my day to day and I've lost my passion for Christ. There's so many times where we go down directions and we end up somewhere we just didn't think we would be. So Ben mentioned I'm a wedding planner. Um, I've had a company for about eight years, and I love it. People ask me all the time, isn't that just so chaotic, the wedding day? And I'm like, 
well, I have three small kids at home. This is controlled chaos. Uh, but one of my jobs as a wedding planner is to help all my couples find really good vendors. So someone to bake their cake, florals, catering, that's a big one. So my very first year in the business, I had this sweet couple that was getting married at a little country farm about an hour and a half outside of Raleigh, where we lived at the time. And I set up a full day and a full itinerary for them to taste cakes and check out flowers and decorations. And I had the schedule set and the groom calls me and he's like, hey, do you think it'd be okay if we met with this caterer? It's just like a guy that kind of does barbecue on the side that's supposed to be really good. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a red flag in the wedding industry because like a wedding is a big production. I'm like, I need someone who knows what they're doing. But I was like, sure, you know, if you really want to, we can. He said, okay, great. He's having a party at the end of the night and we'll go out and taste the food. So I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be a little cookout where all the couples come in and do samples. That's pretty normal. So we have our day full of meetings. It goes great. And we hop in the car. I'm following behind this couple. And we go down a path. And I'm thinking, all right, maybe we're going to a venue. And then it turns into a gravel road. And then it turns into a dirt road. And then it just turns into grass. And I'm like, where are we going? And all of a sudden, we come around a corner, and we're in a big field. And there's this dilapidated building right here. And then there's all these, like, bonfires around. And there's tons of people. And everyone's in, like, shorts and T-shirts. Everyone's got beer. And I'm like, okay, this is actually a party. And so we get out, and I'm like, I don't, I don't think this is the path we were supposed to take. This is not where we're supposed to be. So we get out, but the groom's like, no, this, this is the address. He said it was a party. And I'm like, okay. So we get out and everyone is just staring at us. It was almost kind of like creepy when we got out of the car and was just looking. And I was like, okay, well maybe it's because I'm like in a blazer and heels and I've got my clipboard and they're like, what is she doing here? So we get out of the car, we go up to the first people we see and they're like, hey, do you know so-and-so? And we're like, no, we're here to see. And we say the caterer's name. And they're like, mm, okay. And then they just kind of walk off and I was like, well, that's weird. And then we're standing there, everyone's still looking at us and another guy comes up and he's like, man, cheers to Bobby. And I'm like, Bobby? And he's like, he was such a good man. It's so sad what had happened. And I was like, we're at a funeral. We were at a funeral. We had pulled up to somebody's funeral. I'm like, this is not where we're supposed to be. This is not the path we were supposed to go down. And so, of course, I am so embarrassed. I'm mortified. And the bride is. The groom thinks it's hilarious. And I'm like, we got to leave. We got to leave. But nope, lo and behold, here comes the caterer and he walks up to us. He's like, so glad you're in. Come on in to the building. We're going to take some, take some barbecue. I'll show you all my sauces. So you guys, we had a catering tasting at somebody's funeral. <laughs> at somebody's funeral. That was probably by far my wildest, wildest wedding story. And the funny part was they ended up booking him and his barbecue was great. But how many of us, that's us. We go down a path where we think, okay, this is where we're going. And we end up somewhere totally different. Maybe it's just busyness or numbness that sets in, and we just lose that passion for God's purpose in our lives. This is why I love the story of Rahab so much, because it paints such a beautiful story of redemption. You know, the Bible, one thing I love about it is like when you read it over and over, you just pick up new clues. And, and you know, sometimes in the Bible, they'll just mention a man did this or whatever, or a woman did this. But the Bible calls Rahab by name and also says her job, which was a prostitute. In some versions, it's a harlot. You know, women during this time often, they didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, I'm going to be a harlot. That's like the lowest of the low job. I'm going to be that person that no one regards, that no one has respect for. I'm probably going to lose my family over it because it says she didn't live with her family. She had to bring her family into her house. She didn't wake up one day and just make that decision. It was probably a series of things that led her to that. Often during these times, it was when a woman lost her husband and had no other way of support that she turned to this. She didn't choose to just wake up and do it. It was a path that led away from her purpose. But God, God could have sent the spies anywhere else, but he chose her. This is the God of the Old Testament. This is the God that parted the Red Seas and had Jonah swallowed by a whale. He could have just blinded everyone in the city, sent his spies in, and called it good. But he chose to take a woman who had walked so far away from a life of purpose and weave her story of redemption into his story. No matter where you feel your walk is right now, it's not too late to walk in the purpose God has called you. We say it often here, if you have breath in your body, no matter how young you are, how old you are, how far you've gone, you have a purpose. So what? You have a past. We all have done things we are ashamed of. That's the beautiful thing about church is we are a place full of imperfect people serving a perfect God. 
2 Corinthians 5, 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We need to stop letting the world dictate who we are because of our past and start speaking life over our purpose and our future. I'm going to say that one more time. We need to stop letting the world dictate who we are because of our past and start speaking life over our purpose and our future. We have to start speaking mom's life and purpose over our kids' futures. Dads, we have to start speaking it. Students, we have to start speaking it over our schools. God is still in the business of taking lost people who are wandering down the wrong direction and redeeming their story. You know, this is not just a story in the Bible, but this is something that happens every day. You hear stories of all the time of people who are bound by addiction, who were so far gone, and God just changed their life, and they were able to reach millions of people by just the people they touch next to them and then next to them. You are probably thinking, well, what is my purpose? We've been talking about that. And that brings me to my second point on purpose, and that's this. Our purpose is not complicated. So I read kind of a cool statistic the other day in a book we were reading um, with my mom's small group that Gen Z is the first generation to fully have their life documented on social media. So I think about my own kids when we got pregnant with Judah. Um, we had a whole photo shoot with our dog and signs and we put it on Facebook and then we had a gender reveal and we put that on Facebook and we had first um, newborn photos and then we had first year old photos and then birthday party photos. I'm the queen of photos. But I just think about this generation who is looking at social media 24 seven and seeing all these people, what their purpose is, where they're going, their lives. Everywhere you look today, people are selling self-help books. My favorite are those people who are always like, you need a change in career, buy my course for $29.99, you can make millions. And how to elevate our careers. People are searching everywhere for purpose and plans on how to get there. You know, and sadly, it's not just the world, it's Christians too sometimes, we're guilty of that. God has blessed us in the church with spiritual gifts, but sometimes we often mistake those for our purpose when those are merely tools to move us into our purpose. So I hear this so many times, well, I know God has given me this gift, but I, I just, I have to do this job because we need it financially or do this, or maybe you have the gift of teaching and you're not doing anything necessarily in the church yet, but you're teaching in schools. That is a purpose. God has called us to reach our community. And it is so important to remember that, that those spiritual gifts God has given you, you can use them in your community and where you're at. I also think we have to be careful as Christians too when it comes to purpose that not to get caught up in the titles of ministry or just the work of ministry. So what I mean by that is sometimes, and I am guilty of this even as a pastor's wife, I'll be like, okay, well, I did this for this event and I've worked in the nursery this week and I've done my devotion. And, but I'm like, when, when did I have time with the Lord? Where is my heart at? And sometimes we just check it off a list. But God has called us to remember the purpose. You can't forget the what the why behind the what you are doing. We have to walk in God's word every day and remind ourselves that we are building his kingdom. Right. Let me talk to the moms in the room for a minute. You are not a failure and you are more than your title. I think as moms, we often move from stage to stage to stage in life. So for instance, you may be in here and you're not a mom yet and you're longing for that and we are standing in agreement with you. You know, I know that's so hard sometimes Mother's Day is just can be a tough spot for people. And then maybe you're a new mom in here and you're just exhausted and you have babies and you're home all day changing diapers and feeding. And for me, sometimes I feel like all I do all day long is like get my kids off of each other. They like to fight. Or maybe you're a mom in here with teenagers and we will have extra prayer for you at the end. And you're just overwhelmed with anxiety because you've raised these beautiful children and the love of the Lord and you're sending them out into a dark world and you just worry, is the seed I planted enough? Or maybe you're a mom in here who has kids who have graduated and you're in a new stage of life or you have adult kids that have started their own families or moved away or maybe you're estranged from kids. I feel like sometimes we just move from these stages to stages to stages and we forget our purpose because we're pouring into these stages so much. I also think as moms, sometimes we can often feel useless in the kingdom of God if we're really being honest. You know, I can think back to a time when we had the twins. They came home on these little heart monitors 
and they sounded like bombs when they would go off if their heart rate dropped. So I'd take them to church, we'd get about 15 minutes in, and then they would go off, and I'd have to go out. And it was just over and over. And then finally they got off those, and I took them to the nursery. And for eight months, they did not stay in the nursery for a whole single service. They cried every time, and they tried everything. But it was like one would do it one week, and the other would do it the other week. It was just never ending. And I remember crying to Ben one night, and I was like, I just what am I doing? I have no ministry. Like we have been together in youth ministry for so long and I've loved serving and I just don't do anything right now. But that is a lie from the enemy because moms, I am here to remind you that your every day is a ministry, that those babies that you're pouring into, that is your ministry. Those teenagers you're sending into the world, that is your ministry. Those seeds you're planting every day in your children matter. Those prayers that you are praying are shifting the atmosphere in your family. And that goes for dads too. Those prayers, they change your family. I'm here to remind you that God hasn't forgotten you moms. In fact, I'm here to remind you that there is something so powerful about a mom who calls on the name of Jesus and pleads the blood over her family. You are more than just a title and you matter. I think motherhood is just one of the most beautiful gifts God can give us. But I also think it is important to remember that he's given each of you unique hopes and dreams. And for some of us, it's time to pick those back up. You know, as we begin begin to talk more about purpose, I often think about how as humans in our fleshly selves, how we judge worth and purpose and how we base it off of. And I feel like a lot of times we base it off a human scale. But if we judge our worth and purpose on a human scale, we will fail every time. Why? Because the world scale is always changing. You can never be good enough, never make enough money. You can never do this many activities with your kids. But guess what? God's scale never changes. His word is never changing. His purpose over our life is never changing. What we see as failure, God sees as a testimony. What the world sees as these mundane things every day, God sees powerful prayers with our kids. What God sees, he just sees a path for a miracle in those moments. So I want to tell you this, our purpose is just simply this, to live a life built on a relationship with Jesus and to share that relationship with the world. Our purpose is this, to live a life built on a relationship with Jesus and to share that relationship with the world. I think sometimes we just have to overcomplicate it. I need to do more. I need to do this. But God just wants us to fall in love with him every day, and he wants us to share that with a broken and a hurting world. You know, I mentioned that I have the honor of leading an awesome mom small group. And uh, I know I see some of my ladies in here. And we've been studying Jenny Allen's book called Restless. And in it, she kind of talks about finding your purpose. And it's just been a powerful read. But one of the illustrations she gives that I thought was so neat about purpose is that we all have these strings of our life, whether it be where you're at physically in your place, the people are around you, that's a string, that's your ministry, your spiritual gifts, your traumas, your hurts, All of it is intertwined, and God uses that purpose to glorify him. And I think that is just a beautiful picture of how God uses every part of our story for him. The final point that I wanted to talk about today is this. Our purpose is vital to others. I want to read another scripture, and it is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, who his mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Amdadab, Amdadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Solomon, Solomon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now I have to admit, anyone in here uh, ever read this passage in Matthew 1 and you just kind of skip over the names because they're hard to read? That is me. So um, when I was studying about Rahab, I was like, where else is her name in the Bible? Like I knew it. I've read Matthew 1 a lot. And so I Googled it. And I was like, yes, it's in the line of Jesus. I I knew it was in the scripture with all the, the names. And so one thing I love about the Bible is it's just so exciting every time you read it and you find new things. So when I was studying, we had just put the kids to bed, and in our house, that is the hour of quiet, we call it. We get the kids to bed, it's always chaotic. Uh, Usually they get up about five million times for a drink of water or a snuggle, which I love to give. (laughs) And uh, then we just crash on the couch like this. So I'm studying, and Ben's on the couch trying to relax, because he's preached like three sermons that week. And I'm reading this verse, and I run out to him, and I'm like, Ben, did you realize Rahab was in the line of Jesus? 
And he was like, yes, I'm a pastor. I read Matthew. <laughs> but I was like, I, that's so exciting, uh, isn't that? But I just, I just was just inspired by this passage because God used a harlot, a prostitute in the line of our holy savior. He not only gave her a purpose, but he named her and her story so she could inspire future generations. He's, she's even mentioned later on in the Bible in Hebrews 11, chapter 31. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. God knew her story would inspire others down the line like his disciples. Not only did Rahab's story inspire future generations, but it saved her family and changed her family line forever. You know, as I read the Bible as a mom, sometimes when I read you know, people in the Bible, I always like think about them as parents. I'm like, what they do with their kids? And, and I, I thought about Rahab and I'm like, what an, what an amazing story. Because, you know, I, it doesn't mention her kids or if she had them, but if she did, they were watching their mom live this life. And studies have shown that when you have a parent in that life, a lot of times that trauma, that addiction, it passes on and passes on. And because of her one moment of faith, she changed her family line forever. Her family was taken out of that, that city of sin, the Bible calls it, and placed at a place with Israel, with God's people. She didn't just change her life, she changed her family's life. And I want to read this verse again. Joshua, Joshua 6, 22. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters, and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. At that time when the story is being written, Rahab had no idea what her whole role would look like in history. But in that moment, she trusted God and knew that walking in her purpose, which was to save those spies, she would not only save herself from death, but those she loved. And how much of that is true of us as parents, as mothers, as people of believers, that those moments of faith can change our families forever. Let me encourage you with this. You have no idea how many seeds are being planted in a Rahab's life around you. Maybe it's a child that has walked away or a stranger in the street that feels like they have nothing to live for. But you walking in your purpose, sharing the love of Jesus, could be the lifeline they need to experience. Moms, you could be raising up the next great preacher. You could be raising up the next missionary to go across the seas. You could be raising up the next football player who can reach millions on social media that none of us could ever dream of. The decisions you make today and the purpose you walk in could change your family forever. What you do in your everyday life matters to the kingdom of God and to the lost who are looking for answers. Um, as I kind of wrap up, I'm going to ask the band to come up, but I, you know, was praying about how I wanted to end this message because I just really had a pressing in my heart for people who in here who are lost and who are weary, you know, are just struggling that others may not even see. And I debated sharing this story because it's heavy. And like I said, it's Mother's Day. But I thought back to a few years ago um, when we lived in Noonan. Judah had just turned one and I had joined like a little library group it was like a play date, and I met a few moms, and we discovered we lived in the same neighborhood, and it just kind of grew into this group that met a lot. And it was really neat because we were all different backgrounds of faith and all different ages, and, um, but we all had kids around the same age. And in fact, I used to have a Christmas party at my house every year, and the first year we all, there was about 10 moms, so we had like 10 kids. And then the last year before we left, I had to run out of gym because there was like 40. We'd all had like three or four kids by that time. Um, but one of the moms there, she was a fellow believer, and during COVID, we had all kind of just really just been having a hard time. I'm sure if you remember when you had kids, we were stuck at home, there was no play dates, there was no support, and things had kind of opened back up, but the library hadn't opened up, the indoor playgrounds hadn't opened up. So this mom said, well, you know what, I'm going to start a music class, and I want it to be open door. Whoever you want to invite can come in. So we would converge on our house on a Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, and there would be just chaos everywhere. I mean, there would be like 20 moms, 40 kids in this house, and we would do music time. And sometimes we would talk, other days it was just screaming. But I'll never forget, there was this mom there one day, and uh, I don't even think we introduced ourselves the first day. We kind of just all went around the circle, said a quick thing, and you know, just did mom talk. And I remember she had beautiful red hair, 
And I said, I love your hair. You know, just a mom compliment. And the next week went on and I went back and she wasn't there, but there was another new mom and it was just different moms every week. And then I took a break for two months and the twins had been sick and had just been crazy. And I came back and my friend who ran the music class pulled me aside and she said, did you hear? And I was like, hear what? And she said, that mom had committed suicide. And I just, I could still remember like it's today, just getting in the van, picking up the twins, putting them in their car seats and just weeping in the car, calling Ben and just telling him. My heart was so broken for this mom. She was just like us. She had kids there. They were playing. Like we, we talked mom talk and we had no idea the battle and the hurt that she was going through. My heart was hurting for all the people in this world who feel at the end of their rope. I began to ask God, God, open my eyes to those who are hurting around me, God. Please, this can't happen again, God. Just open our eyes. Let me be a vessel for your hope and love to a hurting world. And God just began to do something in me that year. He birthed a heart and a passion for motherhood ministry. I jumped back into leading my small group, even though I'd kind of taken a break because I just just felt like I wasn't worthy and I just wasn't on my game. But he began to put a boldness into my life to reach out to moms who were struggling, to start asking those real questions, to making sure they weren't alone, that we could get them help they needed, to walk in my purpose of sharing the gospel and the hope of Jesus with others. There are times that I look back in my life when it was so dark. I can remember after we had Judah, I really struggled with anxiety. And there was other times in my life too where I just felt just weak and on the floor and I couldn't get up. But you know what? Somebody else that was walking in their God-given purpose came down beside me and picked me up with them and carried me when I couldn't go on. (laughs) Hear me, this world is desperate for a purpose. They are seeking it everywhere and they will go find it everywhere else but the church if we don't give it to them. Finding your purpose isn't just an idea, it's life and death. If you are living your life for Christ and sharing your story with others could lead them to eternal life, then you are important to the plan of God. I feel such a strong pressing from the Lord to remind someone today that there is still hope, that there is still joy, that there is still peace. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. It doesn't matter that you might be down a different path in a different direction. It doesn't matter what you felt like you have done. You have not messed up too much and you haven't gone too far. God is calling you to walk in a life of purpose and joy. He doesn't want us to walk just to make it through life, but he wants us to walk with boldness, love, joy, and a purpose. I'm going to invite everyone to stand with me. Hey, family, I hope that word blessed you. In fact, I believe that that word is touching lives right now. And maybe that's you. Maybe you feel a million miles away from Christ, but you know right now you need to make a decision to give your heart to him. I would love to give you that opportunity right now. In fact, if that's you, I would love for you to pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner and that I need a savior. Come into my heart, forgive me of my sins and make me whole. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, if that's you and you made that decision, we'd love to hear from you. And maybe you've got some other prayer requests or needs that you'd like for us to pray for. I'd love for you to use the email link listed below and let us know what's on your mind. Thanks for coming out and listening to today's message. And we'd love to see you back later next week.